Prior to 1963, almost all children had measles before the age of 15. That year, the first vaccine against measles was licensed for use and soon became part of the Measles, Mumps and Rubella, or MMR, childhood vaccine in 1971. Then, in 1989, the two-dose vaccine schedule was introduced. The resulting national vaccination efforts were highly successful, leading the United States to declare itself measles-free by the year 2000. So why are we talking about measles now? This is a real challenge and a success and failure, I think, of public health. We were able to eradicate measles in the U.S. 25 years ago at the turn of the millennium. Unfortunately, we see it resurging currently. There are several reasons for this, probably the most important of which has to do with vaccination and vaccine coverage. In the U.S., vaccine coverage has decreased for a variety of reasons. This creates large susceptible populations, and then with reintroduction, which occurs routinely with global travel, as we all participate in, which then allows outbreaks to occur. Because of how successful the vaccine has been, many of today's physicians have not seen measles during their practice. So we'll talk about the measles virus, the current outbreak, vaccination and management. This is probably the most infectious pathogen that we have to deal with in terms of person-to-person -person spread. One marker of this is something we call the r naught or the reproductive rate. r naught, also known as the basic reproduction number, indicates how many secondary infections arise in a susceptible population from one infected patient. If the number of secondary cases are greater than one, so if I'm infected and I infect more than one person, the outbreak expands. If I infect less than one person, then the outbreak contracts and can be eradicated. For example, polio has an R0 of 5 to 6. The common cold, 2 to 3. Influenza is approximately 1 to 2. Compare that to measles, which has an R0 of 12 to 18. It's important to understand that measles is spread by aerosol. That makes it highly contagious. In the indoor setting, with limited ventilation, its contagion is even higher. And what's particularly vexing is that transmission or infectiousness can occur days before symptoms develop. So for several days, one may be infectious and not yet know that you are infected through symptomatology. In classic measles, symptoms begin at the prodromal phase, between 10 to 14 days after exposure. This phase typically lasts for two to four days and is characterized by fever and the three Cs, cough, coryza, or inflammation of the nasal mucosa, and conjunctivitis. Diarrhea may also be present. Up to 70% of patients also develop coplic spots, small bluish-white spots on the buccal mucosa, a couple days before a rash. The erythematous maculopapular rash characteristic of measles appears two to four days after the onset of fever. The rash typically starts in the face and proceeds to the trunk, arms, and legs. Patients are contagious for about four days before and four days after the eruption of the rash. Any child presenting with a fever and rash should prompt consideration of measles. Clinical diagnosis of measles can be a challenge for providers who have not seen measles or in patients who present before the onset of rash or whose rash is less apparent. For those with partial immunity or incomplete vaccination, the presentation can be atypical but these individuals can still be very contagious. To prevent nosocomial transmission, patients who are suspected to have measles should be triaged in outpatient settings. Hospitalized patients with measles should be isolated with airborne precautions to prevent transmission. Clinical specimens in the form of serum testing and nasopharyngeal or throat swabs should be obtained from all patients suspected to have measles at their first contact with the healthcare provider for laboratory confirmation. All suspected cases of measles should be reported immediately to the local or state health department without waiting for diagnostic test results. The public health department should make extensive contact tracing efforts to identify all exposed. So it's very important for us to pay attention to how contagious this is, and our infection control and public health departments have protocols and procedures in place to minimize secondary cases, particularly in our most vulnerable for example, in the office setting, 
one will often have to wait up to two hours to cleanse the office if a known case has presented, given how infectious it may be and the risk of a secondary transmission. While it is true that most cases are self-limiting, about 30% of measles cases can develop complications. Pregnant persons and immunocompromised individuals, such as children with malnutrition, those undergoing cancer treatment, and those who have human immunodeficiency virus, are particularly vulnerable. For pregnant persons, measles can result in miscarriage or preterm birth. Five out of 100 individuals will be hospitalized for pneumonia. One in a 1,000 may die. One in a 1,000 may have encephalitis. So there are a series of very severe complications that are quite frequent and were quite frequent 70 years ago in this country that we no longer see. And many of these complications are irreversible and have lifelong consequences. Even after recovery, children infected with measles are at high risk of late complications, including pneumonia or malnutrition. For children with vitamin A deficiency, blindness due to severe corneal ulceration or perforation can occur. In addition, there are a variety of important neurologic complications, including acute post-infectious encephalitis, measles inclusion body encephalitis, as well as SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. These can have severe long-term consequences. Measles-associated encephalitis is a serious fatal complication of measles. This can occur during the first seven days of infection, between one to six months post-infection, or even years after recovery from measles infection. I am glad that few of us have seen these complications in the U.S. because we see so few measles cases. I am incredibly worried that we are all going to see more of these complications as we see more measles cases around the nation. Given the severity of complications associated with measles, vaccination remains the best way to prevent infection and protect the vulnerable members of our communities. Since a single person with measles can infect up to 18 other people, measles can spread rapidly in susceptible populations. Vaccination has been shown to be highly effective at preventing the spread of this disease. Current U.S. guidelines recommend that children receive their first dose of a measles-containing vaccine, typically the MMR vaccine, at 12 to 15 months of age, and a second dose at 4 to 6 years of age. Infants 6 to 11 months of age may receive an additional dose in outbreak settings or before international travel. For adults, any individual without immunity should receive at least one dose of the MMR vaccine. Routine boosters are not recommended for adults who are fully vaccinated. For individuals at high risk of measles exposure, such as healthcare workers and international travelers, an extra dose may be recommended for those born before 1989. An extra dose may also be warranted in an outbreak setting, if recommended by local or state public health agencies. Given how highly transmissible measles is, it requires the highest level of population immunity to prevent person-to-person -person transmission. Upwards of 95% of individuals need to be measles immune to prevent community spread. When we think of these high numbers of population immunity, we have to take into consideration the large swaths of the population that are not immune. The children born this year who are under 12 months of age have not been vaccinated. Our various patient groups who have a weakened immune system and therefore more vulnerable as well to severe measles complications, such as patients undergoing cancer chemotherapy, solid organ transplantation, such as kidney transplant, a liver transplant, a heart transplant, as well as our many patients who are receiving biologic therapies, such as for neurologic disease, GI disease, autoimmune disease, dermatologic disease. So we actually have large segments of the population who are not measles immune or cannot be measles immune because of underlying disease or age. Therefore, the population immunity in the rest of us who can have a strong immune response is even more important to prevent spread in the community and to protect the more vulnerable members of society. 
We know that the measles vaccine is effective and crucial to achieving population immunity. So let's talk about the vaccine safety. The measles vaccine is incredibly safe. Serious side effects are extraordinarily rare in the one in a million range for a severe side effect. Wild-type measles infection has severe consequences in the one in 100 range. So very common. The only reason we don't see it today in the U.S. is because we have so effectively controlled measles that we rarely see the consequences. But even in the current outbreak in the U.S. this year, hospitalizations are over 10% of cases. That is a very big number with a very severe illness. From a public health standpoint, from a clinician standpoint, from a parent and family member standpoint, the measles vaccine is incredibly safe in relation to what it prevents. And in my view, should be used for all who are susceptible to measles unless there is a medical reason, such as a recent bone marrow transplant, that one would want to delay it. In 1998, a small study that has since been retracted drew an association between the MMR vaccine and inflammatory bowel disease and autism. Despite the serious methodological flaws of the study and abundant evidence supporting the safety of the MMR vaccine, vaccine hesitancy has since been on the rise. Many studies have looked at this association with very large numbers of children over many years and have found no association. So it's very important for the community to look at the totality of the literature to understand that there is no association, there is no evidence that the measles vaccine causes or is associated with autism or other autoimmune disease. Currently, there are no antivirals that are active against measles. Management involves mitigation of complications, as well as early detection and patient isolation to prevent transmission. Antibiotics in the absence of secondary bacterial complications such as pneumonia or sepsis are generally not recommended. For those who are exposed to a patient with measles and who have presumptive immunity, no additional treatments, known as post-exposure prophylaxis, are needed. Those who are unvaccinated or undervaccinated should receive the vaccine. One can be vaccinated within days of an exposure and have the vaccine strain create immunity prior to the wild-type infecting strain causing severe illness. That usually needs to be done within a day or two of exposure, so one needs to know you're in an outbreak setting. If a patient cannot receive the vaccine due to immunosuppression or pregnancy, measles immunoglobulin is recommended. An immune globulin or measles targeting immune globulin can be given, again, the earlier after exposure, the better, but within several days or less than a week. Recent public health discussions have included vitamin A supplementation based on its historical use in low- and middle-income countries. So the evidence for vitamin A's activity really emerged 50 years ago um, in studies in Africa where outbreaks of measles were assessed in the context of malnutrition and in particular vitamin A deficiency and the severity of pneumonia and associated illnesses were greater. Those are very specific settings. And so one needs to be thoughtful to extrapolate those data to other settings, how one thinks about when and where to use vitamin A in the context of acute measles infection depends on the community and the likelihood of vitamin A deficiency. In low- and middle-income countries, vitamin A deficiency has been associated with measles severity and mortality. In the U.S., vitamin A deficiency is rare, and there is less data available on the benefits of vitamin A supplementation in this context. Because measles itself can lead to vitamin A deficiency, even in well-nourished children, a short course of vitamin A at an age-appropriate dose is recommended in all children with measles. For adults in the U.S., supplementation is generally not recommended. It's important to understand that vitamin A is not an antiviral or direct treatment for measles. However, giving a dose or two during the acute phase of measles 
probably has relatively low risk if there is concern. But that must be carefully calibrated to not overdose vitamin A, as overdosing vitamin A has its own severe side effects, including associated mortalities, which we've seen in the U.S. already in this year's outbreak. With the possibility of vaccine-preventable infectious diseases re-emerging, both around the globe and in the U.S., physicians should be prepared to consider previously unlikely differential diagnoses, be able to effectively explain the importance of vaccination to their patients, and point them to factual sources of public health information. We have to remember that infectious diseases are spread person to person. They do not respect borders, they do not respect economies, they do not respect geographies. So highly transmissible infections, infectious agents, can spread everywhere if they are surging anywhere. We see this with tuberculosis, we see this with influenza, we've seen this with COVID. Measles is no exception. If we fail to prevent measles from causing a major outbreak anywhere in the world, it can spread everywhere else by a simple plane ride and inoculate any community that's susceptible. So the best strategy to control measles is to control it at the source, to provide global vaccine access. Everyone who's eligible to be vaccinated should be vaccinated to prevent epidemic spread and outbreaks and to prevent the consequences. It's a vaccine we've used for decades. It is an exquisite safety profile and an exquisite efficacy profile. And to not use it to its full potential is unfortunate. Funding for this video is provided by the Doris Duke Foundation, committed to building a creative, equitable, and sustainable future.